On the eve of April 18th, 1775, British troops were ordered to arrest a man named John Hancock and Samuel Adams in Lexington, Massachusetts. And from there, they were going to seize the arms and provisions at the Concord Arsenal. Uh, Upon hearing this news, Paul Revere and William Dawes took opposite routes to ride to Lexington to warn Hancock and Adams. Uh, Along the way, Revere and Dawes shouted as they rode. They shared the news. The British are coming. The, the, The British are coming. Other riders began joining them and spreading this message. And by the early morning hours of April 19th, a band of more than 40 riders rode throughout the countryside, warning their neighbors of the impeding invasion. Revere arrived in Lexington first, and he met with Hancock and Adams. Dawes arrived about 30 minutes later, joined by a man named Samuel Prescott. They rode on to share the news with the people of Concord. The British are coming. They're coming. But before they reached the town, the British soldiers stopped them at a roadblock and arrested them. Revere was arrested. Dawes and Prescott escaped. But in the escape, Dawes fell off his horse and was injured, leaving Prescott to alert the Minutemen of Concord on his own. Meanwhile, a group of uh, patriots came along and freed Revere from the three British guards who were escorting him to Lexington. And reunited with Prescott, they managed to help Hancock and his family escape um, the British, uh, to escape before the British arrived. Paul Revere, William Dawes, Samuel Prescott, they rode throughout the night sharing this message to alert each person that heard the news that they came in contact with of the impeding attack that was coming. By sunrise on April 19th, 1775, colonists throughout the countryside, the Minutemen, had come together against British forces, and the Revolutionary War began. This news was huge. The message that these men rode with called people to action. In the middle of the night, it awoke them from their, from their sleeping slumber. Like Paul Revere's writers, the shepherds set out to share a much larger message. The Messiah has been born. The good news is here. He is here. Come and see. The problem was not the message, but rather the messenger. See, this morning we're going we're gonna to be in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at the story of the shepherds, the messengers that God chose to share the news of Jesus' birth. But instead of following the cultural stigma that was upon them, the shepherds shared the news with each person they came in contact with. Verse 6, while they were there, while Mary and Joseph were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, and there were shepherds living out in fields nearby, keeping a watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born unto you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. This will be your son to you. You will find him wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. During this time, it was it was common for for a family to to hire a herald or someone to to announce the birth of a child, especially a son. They would do this. They would make a really big deal about the son because it was a symbol of God's blessing to the family name. Their legacy was going to be passed down to another generation. And so they would hire a herald to announce this good news. This is exactly what God does. God God sends an angel to herald or to announce the good news. His son has been born. But what's really unique about this is not the, the message. It's who he chose to reveal the message to. The shepherds. If you think about it, the creator of the world is stepping down into his creation. The universe has been created by God and he is appearing within his creation. It would make more sense to announce his birth to the kings of the day. It would make more sense to announce his birth to the royal families or, or any sort of world leader or world influencer of the time. At least the religious leaders, the ones who have been placed in charge of fostering faith, of growing faith. But no, Instead, he, he chose to send his angels to make an announcement to some, some shepherds. Now, 
you might think, well, of course he did. That's what my nativity shows. Like, it's such a cute little thing. Like, it was a, you know, it makes sense. It all looks good. But what you fail to understand is the shepherds were one of the most disrespected people groups around. They were the lowest of low. The job of a shepherd was so low that, that if a father could not afford slaves to do it, he would give it to the youngest son. Where was David at when Samuel arrived to anoint him? Well, he was a shepherd. He was out in the field. He was the youngest of eight sons. His seven older brothers had other things to do. The role of a shepherd was reserved for slaves because shepherds were uneducated. They, they had no means of advancement in the career. It was what they were. That's who they were. According to the religious system, the shepherds were always rejected. They were rejected by the religious leaders. The religious leaders taught that they were not good enough for God, that they could not be made right with God. In fact, the shepherds could not even live up to the religious rules of the day. They were nomads. They traveled. Oftentimes when they were out tending to the sheep, they would be out there for weeks or months at a time. They were unable to go and offer sacrifices they were unable to go into the temple courts to receive cleansing that they needed. Therefore, they were deemed spiritually unclean. It, it, the religious leaders taught, if you come in contact with a shepherd and you, they physically touch you, then you are unclean. You're ceremonially unclean. And yet, the sheep that these shepherds took care of were the same sheep that were offered for sacrifices. They were without blemish. They were perfect. So they had a very important role, but they were very much outcast. And so you can only imagine how unworthy they felt, how, how rejected they felt, how much of an outsider they felt. If we pause here for a moment, there's times, the reality is, sometimes we can find ourselves feeling a little bit more like the shepherds than what, what we realize because we know the bad things that we do. We know the bad things that we say. We know the thoughts that run through our mind. We know the temptation and the secret sin that we struggle with. And we might cover it up by coming in here and putting on an act on a Sunday morning as we worship. But on the inside, we can feel pretty, pretty unworthy. Sure, God would never reject us, but maybe you find yourself wondering how God could love me in this moment. In this moment where I've done this and this and thought that and said that, treated them this way with all that we've got going on maybe it's simply that wow i've been way too busy because i filled my calendar with so many different things that i've not really even spent time with god in weeks months with that shame that you feel you look around at everybody else in church and it's very easy to start pointing out people man i wish my spouse was like that that family's really got it going together they've got they look good together they've got everything going right oh, i wish my children behaved just like their kids do. Social media doesn't help this. All it does is leave you feeling unworthy and like a failure, a failure as a spouse, a failure as a parent, a failure as a friend, a fake. A few weeks back, we talked about a woman who interrupted a meal at Simon the Pharisee's house. This meal was hosted for Jesus and there were, there were a bunch of other religious leaders that were there because Jesus had come into town and he had taught. And so Simon the Pharisee invites him over and a woman disrupts this meal. As she makes her way into Simon's home, she's a prostitute. Her sin is known by all. She was unworthy. And unworthy is exactly how she would have felt as she makes her way into this room full of religious leaders. All eyes are on her. She feels the rejection. But all she sees is Jesus reclining at the table and she makes her way over to him. And with her tears, as she falls at his feet, they fall down on his feet and she begins to wash his feet with her tears and she lets down her hair. And to us culturally, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but the reality was that was a divorceable offense in her day. You only let down your hair before your husband. To do it out in public was very offensive. So she lets down her hair because she needs to dry his feet. And then she takes this jar that's around her neck this jar that she would have filled with an expensive perfume, a jar that she would have used one drop at a time, one man at a time, and she empties it out on his feet. And, and this was her most valuable possession, and she does all of this in an act of worship. 
This is the kind of worship, as you empty out the jar, a kind of worship that we want to experience. It's a kind of worship that we want to display. It's the kind of worship that we want to approach God with, to approach this season with. An empty the jar mindset. An empty the jar attitude. It focuses on the opportunities that we have before us to love, to serve, to encourage those around us, even when we feel unworthy like the woman did as she came before Jesus. The shepherds, they felt unworthy. The shepherds felt like outcasts in society. But as the heavens opened up, these shepherds, they were willing to be awed by God. And I talked about this a couple weeks ago, about being awed by God. See, we know this story. We expect this story. We expect the Christmas story when we walk in here for the month of December. And because we've heard it and we know it and we can name the characters, we've studied it, it loses its awe. But the reality is, is in this moment, in this story, the, the, the creators of the universe sets in, into motion the greatest story ever told, and he steps down into his creation. And each and every December, we have a chance to be awed by that, or we could take it for granted. We can let it lose its, its, its luster. We can miss the awe of the season. Fear washed over the shepherds, followed by a marvelous wonder and curiosity as the heavens opened up. They did not reject the heavenly host and what they proclaimed, the message that they shared. Instead, they followed the sign because they believed, and their faith led them to action. Verse 16, the shepherds hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph. They found the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him... They spread the word concerning what, he had, what had been told to them about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. These shepherds became the first missionaries of the gospel. After seeing the baby in the manger, they went out, they left, glorifying and praising God for all that they saw. They had, they had purpose. They didn't just go back to their camp and sleep. They didn't just go back to their camp and chill. Like, like they didn't go back to the fire and, and, and relax. They saw, they believed, they shared, they told everyone what they had witnessed. They didn't just marvel at the message. They didn't just sit around and go, man, can you believe when the angel said this and they did that? And like, do you remember? Like, it didn't stay within their group. They went out and they told, they shared the news, they believed it and it changed the direction of their life. A temptation for us during, during this season is to focus on the warm sentiments of Christmas. Focus on the, the Christmas movies, the traditions that we have. Focus on um, the, sh the, the shopping or the gift giving. While gift giving can be a beautiful thing where we receive joy from seeing someone else open up the gift, like that can be our focus. That can be our, our feel-good thing about the season. And we miss the good news in the heart of the holiday. We can miss it. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to save me. This story starts right here with this. The angel told the shepherds the good news for all the people, including those who felt unworthy. And they went and they shared it. The beautiful part about the shepherd's story is they didn't let their, their feelings hinder their faith. They saw the angel. They, 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 they listened to the message. They followed the star. They did exactly what they needed to do. The shepherds didn't let their circumstances define their faith. And this is a truth that we need to ask ourselves here. We need to reflect on here. Are our circumstances defining our faith? Are we allowing our circumstances to define our faith? Because their circumstances did not define their faithfulness. An empty the jar mindset empties the jar in faith to allow God to refill it by his faithfulness. As a church, we're kind of in a similar, a similar place right now, a place where we cannot let our circumstances define our faithfulness. God is blessing our church with new families. God is, God is blessing our church with new ministry opportunities. And best of all, new believers. We've, we've never had more baptisms in one calendar year than we have this year. As a church, like ministry is happening, discipleship is happening, relationships are happening. But with this new growth comes new challenges. Our facilities are being pushed to their limits. Our staff, we, we are being pushed to our limits. And our finances, they're being pushed to their limits as well. 
For the past few months, the elders have spent countless hours planning and organizing the 2023 budget, the budget for next year. And while we see the spiritual growth, while we see the numerical growth, while we see the things that God is doing and blessing our church, the financial growth has remained the same as the previous year. As our church continues to grow, we will require greater expenses. There will be a bigger financial commitment that requires our attention. This past Monday in our elders meeting, I encourage the elders to step out on faith as we step into a new year. And it's the same encouragement that I need to share with you today. It extends to you, to our congregation, to our people. Church, we can't let our circumstances hinder our faithfulness. It's easy to look at our country's current economy and feel, feel defeated. Grocery stores are a place of torture right now as you get to the, to the checkout line and there's that final balance due. I was there last night. It's not easy, it's not fun. It's like one of those boxes right now in adulthood, you just wanna like not even worry about checking off, but then you'd have no food in your pantry. And for some reason, the kids keep wanting food. The city just informed us that, that there's gonna be an increase to waste management, gas prices, interest rates, material costs, all of it is going up. The rapid financial increase to our daily lives can easily create fear in our lives and it could cause us to wanna to hold on, but we can't let our circumstances hinder our ability to give as an act of worship. The woman didn't let her relational circumstances hinder her ability to worship. When she walked in and, and she, she, she fell at Jesus' feet and she gave it all. The wise man didn't let their logistical circumstances hundreds of miles away Months to travel, cultural barriers that they cross to walk in, and, and they're the outsiders, to give a gift fit for a king. They gave their very best, and the king wasn't the king they thought he would be. He was two years old. They gave their very best. Joseph didn't let his physical circumstances hinder his worship. He knew what people were going to say about him. He knew how he was going to be rejected, and he gave it all to raise the Messiah as his son. The shepherds, they don't let the social barriers or their social circumstances hinder their opportunity to go and share, to give it all. They followed, and then they proclaimed it. Each of these people stepped out on faith, and the beautiful thing is, is they didn't know the outcome. We do. They didn't know the outcome. An empty the jar mindset empties the jar in faith to allow God to refill it by his promise of faithfulness. You know, in the Great Commission, many of us know this by heart. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This is what we're commissioned to do as believers. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new believers to obey everything that I have commanded you. But there's a promise at the end of this. And surely I am with you always. Like, like, like he's with us in moments of uncertainty, in moments where we just need to, to, to give or moments where we need to, to worship, moments where we need to serve, moments where we need to surrender. I don't know what the outcome is, but there's a promise here. I am with you. I will not forsake you to the very end of the age. As we wrap up this message this morning and the band makes their way back up, listen to how the story ends for the shepherds. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which is exactly just as they had been told. God chose to include the unworthy shepherds in the Christmas story to portray who the baby would become. Jesus, the Messiah, would not be a man seeking power or status. He wouldn't be a royal family or have great wealth. He wouldn't know a king or befriend a king. He wouldn't even have a place to call home. He would come to us as a shepherd that would love, that would serve and tend to his flock. Though the profession was not viewed with respect by their peers, Scripture always portrays shepherding as a high calling. To shepherd in God's kingdom is to sacrificially care for those who are vulnerable within the flock, as well as giving the daily attention to the sheep that are in need. Shepherding is not meant to drive the flock with force, but to gently lead the flock, always watching for the sheep that becomes separated for whatever reason, distracted, confused, wandering away from the herd, 
The shepherd seeks and finds that sheep and carries them back to the flock, carefully caring for them, bringing them back into the rest of the herd. The shepherd is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Jesus called himself that good shepherd. In John, he says this, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We have been commissioned. I just read it. If you believe in Jesus, if you've, if you've said yes to Jesus, our commission is to, to seek and save the lost. We've been commissioned to share the good news, the same news that the shepherds had been given, even in moments where we feel unworthy. We know the end of the story. We see and understand it way more than the shepherds ever did. But are we willing to share the message? Are, are, are we willing to empty the jar? Are we willing to worship? Are we willing to proclaim the good news? Not just in this season, but each and every day. As we, as we wrap up this morning, I, I just, I wanna challenge you. I wanna challenge you to, 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 to ask yourself, when was the last time I shared the good news with somebody? Wrestle with that. What does that look like? I mean, Paul Revere rode through the countryside shouting what was happening. The shepherds ran through Bethlehem shouting and proclaiming everything that had just happened. Neither of them knew the outcome of their story. We do. So the fear that we have in times to share our story, to share God's story, share the good news, I don't know how it's gonna, I don't know how the outcome's gonna be. None of the people before us did either. But rest assured, he is with us to the ends of the age. So as we get ready to worship, I'm gonna be up here to pray. If you need prayer in this season, um, there'll be elders up here ready to pray. I just wanna encourage you to remember what it is that we've been commissioned to do and to empty the jar in all the ways that we can. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you this morning. We have, a, I, I just, I thank you for the opportunity, God, to look at the shepherds. Lord, the, the, the lowest of low, God, you use them to proclaim your message. You use them to reveal the birth of your son. And God, I just pray that you give us the courage to do the same, to go and proclaim this message, to share, to seek, and, and, and to live confidently knowing that you are with us. Lord, when it comes to giving, when it comes to worship, God, that we have an empty the jar mindset, that we're willing to bring others in and share. Father, I just, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you this morning. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.